One day after former officer Derek Chauvin was convicted of George Floyd's murder, the Justice Department is launching an investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. Attorney General Merrick Garland made that announcement today, acknowledging the verdict in the Chauvin trial, quote, does not address potentially systemic policing issues in Minneapolis. The investigation will include a comprehensive review of the Minneapolis Police Department's patterns and practices, including policies, training, supervision, and use of force. Garland says this is necessary to build trust in the system. I strongly believe that good officers do not want to work in systems that allow bad practices. Good officers welcome accountability because accountability is an essential part of building trust with the community and public safety requires public trust. And there is also a federal investigation into George Floyd's death that is ongoing. This can be a giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. President Biden praised the verdict yesterday and put the spotlight on police reform. He is pressuring the Senate to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Today, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer promised action. The Senate will continue to work that work as we strive to ensure that George Floyd's tragic death will not be in vain. We will not rest until the Senate passes strong legislation to end the systemic bias in law enforcement. The House passed the bill last month. It would make it easier to prosecute officer misconduct and ban practices like chokeholds. While Republicans oppose some of the provisions, Senator Tim Scott said today they're on the verge of a compromise within a week or two. Just moments before the verdict of the Chauvin trial came down, police in Columbus, Ohio, shot and killed a teenage girl. Today, they released new video and those 911 calls in this case. Just a warning for you, this video is disturbing. Makia Bryant was 16 years old. Columbus police say she was threatening two other people with a knife. The body camera video shows an officer approaching a group of people in a driveway when a fight breaks out. Police say the girl attempted to stab two people. Then the officer fired his gun. The killing quickly gained nationwide attention. Now the Ohio State Bureau of Criminal Investigations is leading the inquiry with promises to hold the officer accountable. The Columbus mayor called it a horrible, heartbreaking situation. A teenage girl is dead, and she's dead at the hands of a police officer. Under any circumstances, that is a horrendous tragedy. But the video shows that there is more to this. It requires us to pause, take a close look at the sequence of events, and though it's not easy, wait for the facts as determined by an independent investigation. Officer Nicholas Riordan fired the fatal shots. He has been on the police force for about 16 months. He's been taken off street duty while the investigation is underway. The old saying April showers refers to rain, except in Colorado because there are snow showers and we've seen a lot of them lately. Danielle's in the Weather Center with a first look at your forecast. Here we go again. I know, right, Kim? <laughs> Whether we like it or not, Mother Nature is like, nope, you guys get some rain, some snow, everything in between. Luckily, this storm system is going to be a fast mover and also bring us some really good beneficial moisture that we desperately need to see around here. Unfortunately, the timing right around the evening drive not ideal. We'll take a quick look outside some of our cameras. This is a look out there in Fort Collins. Uh, tough to find anyone out there. Mostly cloudy skies, light snow. This is right atop our building here at Logan and Spear. You can kind of see just how wet the snowfall is, the drops in the camera lens, and then downtown Denver. This is our camera position to top the Four Seasons Hotel, and uh, really tough to make out anything as visibility has been impacted tremendously as this storm is starting to push in closer to here to the front range. You'll notice much of western Colorado still dry, but that snow fall picking up around Summit County, stretching along I-70 into downtown Denver, up to the northern mountains, through the foothills, looking at pretty much everything in between. A little bit of rain kind of mixing in here in the heart of the city, perhaps that rain snow mix just to the north of Broomfield into Boulder. Otherwise, we'll be monitoring these snow showers continuing throughout the rest of this evening. I'd say by about 10:30, 11 o'clock, most of the snowfall already on the ground, and we really aren't expecting much from this system. By early tomorrow morning, the sunshine is back here in the city, but the snow is still flying.
dying up in the northern mountains. The temperatures have cooled off quite a bit, sitting in the low 30s across the urban corridor, 20s up in the foothills. Good thing we really haven't had to deal with the winds. They're picking up a bit around Watkins through Strasburg along the eastern plains out toward Burlington, looking at 20 plus mile per hour wind gusts. But uh, again, the winds really should be quiet for us the rest of this evening. As we look ahead toward tomorrow, we will trade in the snowfall for thunderstorms. We'll be tracking those and then a look ahead to the weekend. A nice warm up coming our way. I'll have that full forecast for you guys in just a few. We need rain. Rain would be nice again. <laughs> I'll take rain. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and get back to that. OK, all right. We'll talk more about the weather later. COVID-19 has killed millions of people worldwide and survivors have dealt with their own struggles. The long road to recovery includes physical therapy and even organ transplants for some. The United Network for Organ Sharing, or UNOS, was forced to create a whole new category of patients in need. Jalisa Irizarry explains the need for COVID-related organ transplants across the country and here in Colorado. The outside of a hospital can feel so commonplace. The bustling sounds of a routine day contrast the extraordinary battles going on inside as patients and loved ones look for a sign. <laughs> is that I start each day with a grateful heart. For Trinity and Brian Raymond, it wasn't always so obvious. Pretty uh -huh. fitting, yeah. As the two recall the last four months of their lives, Brian battled COVID-19 while Trinity watched him worsen. I don't think there's like any words. I just never thought that it would get that bad. And I think, um, you know, some days it was like hour by hour, like what? What is happening? Is he going to get any better? Is he not? Brian was transferred to UC Health from Montana, where he was placed on a ventilator 17 days after testing positive for COVID. The father of four fought for months, but his lungs were giving up and he needed a transplant. The transplant for COVID-19 infection is, is a very new phenomenon. Dr. Mohammed Aftab was one of Brian's doctors and says COVID-related lung and heart transplants are something we are now seeing across the country. According to NBC News, nearly 60 transplants were performed through March for patients with COVID-19-related organ disease. That includes 54 lung transplants, <laughs> including Brian's which UC Health says was the very first COVID-related transplant in Colorado. There's, you know, no other way to explain how I got through everything. Like Trinity said, without, without God on my side looking over me. Brian was able to leave the hospital and is now recovering in Colorado for the next three months. As he and his wife look back at all that happened to get here, their hearts are with the donor's family that allowed him to survive extraordinary circumstances in an ordinary place. Jalisa Rosari, 9 News. Dr. Aftab says it's too soon to say whether we will see a large surge of COVID-related heart and lung transplants, but he does say even if someone recovers, some of the organ damage could be problematic down the road. The U.S. is marking a milestone in the nationwide COVID-19 vaccine rollout. 200 million doses administered as of today. President Biden wants to see that number continue to rise. He's asking all businesses to give their workers paid time off to get vaccinated. To help, the IRS will now give a tax credit to small businesses, those with fewer than 500 employees, to reimburse them for the cost. Biden said today no one should lose a single dollar to pay to get vaccinated. Every employee should get paid leave to get a shot. And businesses should know that they can provide it without a hit to their bottom line. There's no excuse for not getting it done. Everyone in the U.S. age 16 and older is now eligible. The CDC says over half of adults have received at least one dose and over 26% of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated. Here in Colorado, we're almost at the point where vaccine supply outpaces demand. Almost, though, one day after announcing a few state run vaccination sites would take same day or walk up appointments. Governor Polis was at the ranch in Loveland to see how it's going. One problem, they did run out of appointments by 930 this morning. The ranch does have another 1200 open slots for tomorrow. Ball Arena in Denver and the Colorado State Fairgrounds in Pueblo are also offering same day appointments, but no walk ins. 
More than 1.5 million Coloradans are now fully vaccinated. That's almost 26 percent of the state's population. More than 40 percent have at least some protection against COVID-19. Nearly 15 percent are still waiting on their second dose of Pfizer or Moderna. The gray represents Coloradans under 16 who are too young to get the vaccine just yet. But as more people are getting vaccinated, things are picking back up here and there like at DIA. Now that more people are flying, the airport can get pretty crowded at times. It is a huge difference compared to this time last year when travel at DIA was down almost 90 percent. Nine News reporter Victoria De Leon gives us a look at what's changed. The pictures can be strange to look at. Empty parking lots and barely anyone going through security at the Denver International Airport. A year later, things look different and almost normal. Emily Williams with DIA says the airport is recovering quickly. Last week, um, our passenger traffic was down about 20% over 2019, where nationally that number was about 40%. While some COVID-19 precautions remain in place, social distancing becomes a challenge. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's a really hard thing and it's something we experience at the grocery store, um, in, in any crowded location like that. Airport employees can remind people to keep their distance, but Emily says it's tough to control everyone. If you spread people out on the train, it backs up into TSA and you kind of just move the problem elsewhere. And, and again, just like the things that we've learned throughout the pandemic, there's a level of personal responsibility too, right? To try to avoid large crowds, Emily recommends planning ahead and arriving early. Now that people are feeling comfortable traveling, we want them to remember all of the things that they've been practicing for the last year, which includes social distancing and mask wearing. Victoria De Leon, Nine News. If you do have a trip coming up, the U.S. Department of Transportation has some tips to help keep you safe at the airport. You can find all those details on our website.